At the end of last year and segueing into this year, I asked all of you, what are some trends that you are tired of that you would like to leave behind in 2023? Now, what are some trends that you would like to see grow and continue? And pretty universally, people agreed that a trend they want to see more of is coziness in their fantasy, which made me really excited as well because I have been all on board with the cozy fantasy trend. And I also recently got a comment asking if I had any cozy fantasy book recommendations. And while I have done a few videos here and there with some cozy book recs, I decided I wanted to do a cozy book recommendations guide where I go through the various different things that fall into cozy because cozy means different things for different people. So I'm going to have different categories and then within each of those categories I'll have recommendations. That way we're taking what is already a subgenre of fantasy and then we're narrowing it down and hopefully in doing this you can find the exact kind of cozy fantasy that you're looking for. I'll have all of the books I mentioned in the description bar down below in case there is one that piques your interest. But I also want to note that of course while some of these fit pretty comfortably within their category, some of them would actually overlap and they could easily go in different categories. So when that happens, I'll try to make note of that. But the categories that we're going to be going through would be cozy fantasy that has low stakes, is cute, and is charming. And then another, because I could describe basically everything <laughs> in this video, another element to this is do they have downtime, which I know seems kind of silly, but part of what has made Cozy Fantasy, I think, so relatable and so enjoyable is seeing characters in their day-to-day -day lives, seeing as how they navigate regular conversations and regular day-to-day -day stresses as opposed to apocalyptic world-ending type of situations. So after that, we have the category of fairy tale. I don't know why I did this. I, I put little twinkles in my notes, and so I guess I was replicating that. But this can fall both within whimsical fairy tale and grim fairy tale, because I think just because something is grim doesn't necessarily mean it's outside the realm of cozy. Sometimes things can be cozy and a little bit on the dark side, too, but that doesn't negate the whimsical. There are also fairy tale type of cozy fantasy that are whimsical as well. Then from there we have adventure, which typically I would say is almost the opposite of cozy, but there are cozy adventures. There are ones where you feel comfortable but excited and happy, and you're never really too worried that everything is going to go wrong and everyone's going to die. That's not really a main concern, but you're just happy to be along for the journey. And then the last category would be classic slash nostalgic. For me, I think I think this might be the one that cues cozy in my mind quicker than the other ones. You would think it would be the first category, but there's something about that nostalgic feeling that just makes me think of being a kid, laying on the floor in my room, reading a book, the sunlight's peeking through the window, and you just feel content and happy as you're reading through this story. And so I wanted to have some that fit within that category as well. I'm going to start with the one that is quintessential cozy, which would be the low stakes, cute, charming, do they have downtime? And Kiki's Delivery Service. Is there a book that better captures that? So this is one that I read recently in uh, preparation for the Studio Ghibli chat I did for the movie of Kiki's Delivery Service. If you've never seen the movie and you've never read the book, it is a middle grade story that follows a young witch who is determined to follow in her mother's footsteps. And the year that they turn 13, they go off on their own and they spend a year just trying to figure out life, basically. It's sort of a coming-of-age story. It's sort of a reflection on growing older, the loss of your innocence as a child, but then the beauty in change. And there's so many things about it that are so sweet and so darling. And thus far, it's been one of my favorite Studio Ghibli movies I've watched. If you love Studio Ghibli, I am doing a whole series over on my side channel where I watch through the movies and then do discussion videos with my friends. Sometimes I do solo dedicated reviews or I talk about them and do mini reviews and vlogs. So if you're a Studio Ghibli fan in general, check out Full Meta Analysis, that side channel. But regardless, I just had the best time with this, both the book and the movie. It's so cute. It's so darling. But my friend Christy, who has her own channel, she described it as somewhat melancholy at the same time because while I'm not somebody who typically finds myself saddened by stories of children growing up, there was just something about this one that captures the beauty of childhood and the beauty of adulthood 
but the fact that they are different means that there is something to be lost as a person grows older. And it really actually did kind of make me sad, even though it's sweet also. And Kiki is just an adorable main character. While the story is middle grade, I don't want that to deter anybody from picking it up because I think adults can certainly enjoy this. And if you want to watch the movie, my husband, it's been his favorite Studio Ghibli movie we've watched. He thought it was delightful and charming and cute. And both of us agreed that we could easily rewatch this tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's just one of those stories that you can't get enough of. After that, of course, had to mention Legends and Lattes, because this is for a lot of people what introduced them to cozy fantasy. So I didn't want to wait too long before I brought it up. And this is one where it just captures the feeling of being in a coffee shop, having the sense of cinnamon rolls baking and coffee and the music in a coffee shop and just that atmosphere. It captures it so well. But then it certainly does have low stakes in that you're not really worried about the world ending, but you are worried about the things that the main character cares about, which would be trying to establish this business, trying to get the word out about this business and having to deal with people that think this is prime real estate and they want this area and they want something that the main character has and they want, you know, there's like these people that are proving to be antagonistic for the main character, even though it's not antagonistic for the entire world. And I just found that Whenever there was a threat to the main character's dream of having this coffee shop, I cared so much, <laughs> even though I wasn't expecting to. I was fully anticipating that this would be fluffy and then it wouldn't have a ton of substance. I wouldn't care that much, but I did. I cared so much when reading this one. If you haven't checked out Legends and Lattes, I do feel there's a reason that this one has earned a lot of hype in the cozy fantasy corners of the community. <laughs> and then from there, we have the very secret society of irregular witches. I don't know that there's a story that does cute and wholesome and cozy better than this one. There's just so much to it. There's so much about acceptance of yourself, finding your place within society, finding your people, your found family, and then also looking out for children and being a mentor figure and a parental type of figure for them. It's precious. Plus, there's a really cute little love story in this as well. So you follow, you've probably heard me talk about it, so I don't know how much I need to say, but you follow a young woman who is living in our, our own world, and she's a witch, but witches, their presence is kept a secret, so she has to live relatively isolated. She can't really ever let anybody in and know her full self, uh, but one day there is a person who asks for her to teach these three young orphaned witches how to control their powers. And she decides, you know, I it would probably be best if I took this job. And she doesn't really know what she's getting into, but she wants to help. And she grows to care very much about these three girls. There is a man who's also very protective of these three girls. And then there are these elderly individuals who are also protective of the girls and how they all come together for the enrichment of the little girls' lives and just in general, how they all enrich each other's lives. It's just, it's so cute. <laughs> it's so cute. And when I read this, I was really honestly surprised by not just how much I cared, but I instantly thought this is going to bring so many people so much joy. So if you haven't checked out The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, definitely check this one out. After that, we have Monsters We Defy, and I have described this one as a cozy heist. So it's a little different from the other ones that we've talked about in this category so far, but still I think fitting in that it does have that do they have downtime feel. So this is taking place in the United States in the 1920s, I believe. And the main character is somebody who she has a curse and a boon that she has to work with in order to just get by in life. And she's trying really hard to not rely on her powers, but sometimes her powers would be very beneficial for those in her community. And there are some individuals who have gone missing. And so she's trying to do everything she can to basically solve this mystery. And along the way, she sort of recruits other people and it's a lot of misfits. And the reason I describe it as a cozy heist is because that heist feeling of you gotta get the gang together, you gotta establish what the problem is, and everybody in their own quirky, interesting ways contributes to the grand plan. It definitely has that within it. And the characters themselves, the interactions that they have with each other, while the stakes themselves are serious and there are serious things going on, the way that the characters talk to each other and treat each other and get to know each other, I thought was really sweet. So I think this one would be 
I, I don't know. I think all of these are good just weekend reads, you know, pick up on a Friday night if you've got the night to yourself kind of books. But this one in particular, it's maybe not quite as cute as the other ones. Maybe the stakes are a little higher, but I still think it fits within this category quite well. From there, we have Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. So I know I've, you know, I'm a fan of this one. I talk all the time about how it reminds me of Final Fantasy X. So I know, I know we're probably tired of hearing about it, but Yumi has a lot of downtime. That's really what established for me why it goes in this category. The stakes, they get pretty high, <laughs> they get pretty big. But for a lot of the story, those stakes aren't yet so pressing. So you actually do find the characters have time to get to know each other. They get to learn about each other's passions, what their life has been like thus far, what led to them being the way they are, why they're scared about certain things, nervous about certain things, why they're bitter about certain things. And then you also see them just go hang out together, which was actually really fun. It was very reminiscent of watching an anime where characters are just walking through town, almost like Sailor Moon, where you have these big bad guys and the stakes do get really big, but then you have episodes where they're just talking about this shop down the street that the artist is really good and, you know, stuff like that, where it's got a mix of both. It's got the high stakes moments and then the moments where there's downtime. The characters can just talk and interact and get to know each other and open up and it's really sweet and I really quite enjoyed those moments. <laughs> and then last for this category, and this one could have easily gone into fairy tale and maybe maybe it would be better suited there, but that would be half a soul. So this story follows a young woman who, when she was very young, some magical individual attempted to steal her soul, but they only succeeded in stealing half of it. And ever since then, this character has essentially had part of her emotions muted, you could say, meaning that they're, she, she doesn't react quickly to things and she feels emotions, she just doesn't always express them. And you're looking at, it's a Regency fairy tale, meaning it's taking place in a time in history with a certain kind of culture and etiquette where it's expected for you to behave a certain way, to respond a certain way, and she doesn't fit the norm, thus she's kind of seen as an outcast. Her cousin cares so much about her and she really wants to ensure that she is looked out for. So she decides, you know what, I'm gonna take her to this magician man that I've heard all about who maybe can cure her of this problem and restore her soul. And so you meet this man and he's very grumpy and he seems very bitter and he seems very upset with how society, especially upper society, treats things like war. He clearly has some trauma and PTSD that he's experienced and there's something so genuine about our main character and how she isn't fitting in with everyone else. Not to say she's not like other girls, not like that, but she doesn't feel the need and she doesn't, uh, She it's like with, it's not in her nature to be exactly like everybody else and to fit within these types that everybody expects you to fit in. She can only really be herself and it sort of allows him to be himself as well. And so the way you see these two characters come together, I think is adorable. And I've described it before as if you like the grump sunshine trope, imagine that except for it's more grump and moonlight, which I know is so cheesy to say, but the character, she really is, she's like, there's a subtleness to her and a sweetness to her that doesn't feel the need to be outspoken and the loudest person in the room. In fact, she's kind of the opposite, but there's still just something so genuine and sweet about her and the two of them, the way they interact and behave with each other, I just thought was adorable. So that would be the books for that category. Now switching on over to fairy tale. First up, we have some books by Elizabeth Lim. I actually wanted to mention a couple. We have Six Crimson Cranes, which I just think is so cozy. This one almost falls into adventure as well, and it easily could, but you follow this young girl named Shiori who does not want to get married, and it's an arranged marriage, but she's like, no. And so she, she does some things that are very uh, over the top <laughs> to prevent herself from having to get married, and she eventually gets cursed and in having this curse she's having to learn more about herself and she's trying to save her brothers who have been turned into cranes she can't tell anybody what's happened to her she can't speak at this point but she's trying to do everything she can to save her brothers and along the way she definitely has a lot of reflective moments but she also 
learns more about the person that she was supposed to marry and some other individuals within her own family. And I think it was done really, really beautifully. The first book, honestly, in my opinion, probably could have been a standalone. There is a sequel. It is rather adventurous and it kind of fills in some of the gaps about certain individuals in Shiori's life. Uh, but even if you don't love the second one or if you don't feel the need to read on, you can probably just read that first one and enjoy that story for what it is. It's really sweet and it's fun and it's adventurous and it just felt like watching a movie. And then Spin the Dawn, definitely a little bit more sad in its tone as you have a character whose mother has died, her father is barely getting by, and her brother has been injured from battle. And so our main character is taking it upon herself to basically run the family's business there. She's a seamstress. Uh, however, this skill is typically not allowed to be used by women. And so she's pretending like it's the men in her family who have done this. And eventually the there's a person in power who needs a new seamstress and they decide there's going to be a competition, which it sounds really bizarre, but they decide there's going to be a competition to determine who is the best and then that person will become the new seamstress. And then from there, it leads into sort of fairy tale things. So it's almost got like two plot lines within it because you start out with almost a competition setting and then you get into an adventure travel setting. And within all that, you have a character who is somewhat inspired by Howl from Howl's Moving Castle. This is sort of like the court magician character and their interactions and their relationship, the way it develops, I thought was really well done. I actually really liked it. I think that this book suffered from marketing not quite doing justice to what the story actually is because they marketed it as Project Runway meets Mulan. And that's not untrue, but that's only true for part of the story. And then it really does kind of become a traveling love story. So if you know that going in, I think that might adjust the expectations and have them be better and more accurate. From there, we have The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea. This is a story that I think is, it, it's very uh, properly given comparisons to Studio Ghibli in general. <laughs> so a lot of the cozy things I feel like have Studio Ghibli vibes, but regardless, this one follows a young woman who she sacrifices herself to a sea god. She goes in place of the woman that her brother is in love with, who is supposed to do this. She goes in her place because she doesn't want her brother and this woman to have to be apart. She sacrifices herself to the sea god, and in doing this, she discovers this whole new world. And I don't want to say too much besides that because I feel like what makes this book special and interesting and whimsical is everything you encounter alongside the character as she is exploring this place. It's got a sense of not, how do I describe, I don't wanna give anything away, but it just really shows the importance of family and the people who have come before and it's really sweet. There's a little bit of a mystery as well. I really, really enjoyed this one and it's just so creative and lush and, and bright and vivid. From there, we have an enchantment of ravens. This is just a sweet, love story with Faye that are not too grim and too dark and Faye that aren't too sexy. It's kind of like an in-between where instead of being like over the top sexual, they're instead more romantic. And instead of being horrific and terrifying, they're like kind of sinister and they're kind of dark, but not so extreme. So it's like a nice cozy balance, which is really nice if you're looking for a Faye story that's not too on those extremes. And we follow a young woman who is a painter. She's tasked with doing the portrait for somebody who is an important Faye figure. And she gets to know this man as she's doing his portrait. However, she draws very human emotions in him. And when his portrait is revealed to his court, they see those human emotions in the portrait as a sign of weakness. And so now she is called into the Fey lands to answer for what she has done and explain herself. And she kind of goes along this path that introduces her to the Fey world. And it's sweet and it's, uh, it's so pretty. The way it's described and the way it's written, it just feels a certain way. It's, some authors just have a way of capturing the setting. And I think the setting itself is captured very well, as well as just the feeling of the Fae and the fantasy elements. Last for this category, uh, I ended the last category with Half a Soul. So we have the same author and that would be 10,000 Stitches. 
This one felt much more fairy tale in that it's somewhat Cinderella inspired. And you have this young woman who is part of a working class. And it really shows the way in which the working class is mistreated, not just in the time that it takes place, but in general, in the way that people who have to work extremely hard and they don't have a lot to fall back on, they don't have a safety net, how difficult life can be, especially when your whole life centers around the fact that you have to work. And our main character is trying very hard to create a certain thing for somebody, uh, thinking that she is in love with this other person. And in trying to create, it's almost like a fairy godmother Cinderella feel. And there's this character that helps her, but he is showing her really what life is about and how she should be treated, how the world should treat each other. And so maybe the person she has her eyes on isn't the person that she should have her eyes on. It's one of those situations. It's really cute. It's really cute. And that character does pop up in Half a Soul. So if you read both of these, you will see a little bit of crossover there. Now on to the adventure cozy fantasy. So first up, we have Tress of the Emerald Sea. This is inspired by The Princess Bride, which I haven't read. I've seen the movie. If I had read it, I probably would have it on this list as well, but I can't say with certainty. However, Tress of the Emerald Sea, inspired by The Princess Bride, you follow a young woman who her love has been taken. And even though she knows nothing about sailing and nothing about fighting, and she really doesn't think she's equipped to go on a rescue mission, she decides I'm gonna go on a rescue mission because nobody else is, and I want to do what I can to save this person I love. And in typical Sanderson fashion, the setting itself is really interesting and unique. It's oceans of spores, and depending on where they are, the spores react differently. And so they have to navigate each of these new areas in a different way. And she has to use her intelligence and bravery to get through things. She has to think through things. And she's a character that's fun in that she is not rash. She actually will stop and process what's happening and think, should I say this? Should I not say this? Should I do this? And she thinks through her actions and her words, which is really nice and refreshing <laughs> to see. After that, we have Blade of Secrets. And I think this author in general does a good job of writing stories that have a feeling of coziness to them. And in this one, we follow these two sisters and one of them has magical abilities when it comes to making weapons. She is hired to make a weapon for someone very important. However, she ends up finding out that this person wants to use the magical weapon she's creating to do bad things. And so she realizes I cannot let this weapon I created fall into this person's hands and she has to go on the run and she brings her sister and then two other individuals sort of tag along. And so they're on the run, but the sister relationship I think is really well done in this where you get to see the way in which when a character has to take on the parental role and they're a sibling, how that weighs on them, how they never get to really fully fulfill one role or the other because it's impossible. You can't fulfill both those roles and you shouldn't have to. And the pressure that puts on the younger sibling to allow that to happen because they know it's not fair. But for a long time when they were young, they didn't have a choice. They needed someone to take care of them. But then as they're getting older and they're becoming their own person, there's this guilt when it comes to going their own paths and their own separate ways. And I think all that is handled really, really well. And then there is a little sweet love story in this as, as well. And just a lot of questions about growing up, growing apart, growing together. And I think the book is a lot of fun. It's a duology, actually. So I should say, I should say the two books are a lot of fun. After that, Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, as well as Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands. There will be another book in this series. I don't know how many books there will be in this series, but I know we'll at least get a third one, which is really exciting. So this story follows a young woman in academia. In the first book, she is trying to, as the title implies, create an encyclopedia of fairies, and she's trying to document all of the different folklore that she has heard and assess what is real, what is exaggeration, and just study the Fae in different places. And in the first book, she goes to this very rural Nordic type of place, and she is not very good at befriending locals. She's very introverted. She doesn't really know how to talk to people, but she knows how to study the Fae, and she is relying on her expertise of them to try and get get her job done. However, the local people know a lot and they have a lot to offer in the way of information. And Emily's very insufferable, but kind of lovable co-worker, Wendell Bambleby, tags along 
and he handles the talking to locals and getting to know people, and he's charming and charismatic, and she's studious, and the two of them work together to try and create this encyclopedia, and then shenanigans ensue. It's so fun. It's so cute, and I had such a great time with it. I enjoyed the sequel as well. I think I enjoyed the first book a little more than the second book, but they're both great, and I can't wait for that third one. And then last for the adventure one, we have <laughs> A Wizard's Guide to Defensive baking. It's such a, it's such a long title, but A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking is about this young girl who has magical powers specific to baking. So for example, she kind of wills the dough that is baking to be just flaky enough and don't, don't get burned and don't be too doughy. Make sure, and she can kind of ask the dough to take a certain shape and to have a certain texture and it ends up resulting in her creating amazing baked things so she works in her family's bakery and then at the very opening of the story she walks into the bakery to get ready for work and there's a dead body on the floor which sounds pretty dark and also obviously unsanitary um but she's like oh my gosh there's a dead body and she doesn't really know what to do at first and because she is one of the people in the city who has magical powers, she is seen as a suspect. And so now she's trying to deal with that. And it also seems like there's something more sinister going on in the city where there might be certain people that are trying to turn the city against magic users. And the reason why is a mystery and our main character is just trying to She's just trying to get by. She just kind of wants to go back to baking. <laughs> That's her love and passion. And she doesn't ever think that her baking would result in her being a hero. She doesn't really think her baking would ever amount to anything super important, but perhaps her skills are more important than she could have ever anticipated. So it starts low stakes, but actually gets pretty high stakes. And I do want to say most of the adventure ones, you follow characters as they're traveling to places. And in this one, you're more contained to a city. You don't really see the character travel, but it does have an adventurous feel to it as the character does navigate through different parts of the city. And then last for the classic nostalgic feel, I won't go into too much detail about these ones just because because they're older. So a lot of these you've probably heard a lot about. Some of them I've talked about a fair amount in the last couple of years. So the first ones we have Green Rider and Arrows of the Queen. Arrows of the Queen, uh, the very first one is the one that's exceptionally cozy and it has a coming of age story. You follow a young girl named Talia who she lives in a very abusive community and then she is whisked off by this magical horse to try and fulfill this role as one of the queen's the people that protect the queen. And she has to go through academics to get to a position where she's eventually an adult and she can fulfill this role fully. But as a child, which is what the first book is looking at, she's just trying to learn how to trust and to overcome the trauma that she has experienced. And it's so good. And there are some, oh my gosh, super, super, super sweet moments between her and this little old man that's at the school. And it's so cute. Oh, that's so cute. And then Green Rider follows a young woman who she finds this messenger who dies basically in her arms and tasks her with like, please, please, please deliver this message. It's so important for the safety of the realm. And so she is like, I guess I'll deliver this message. And in taking on this request, she ends up having so many things happen that she was not anticipating. She's in immense danger, but she's realizing this must be really important because so many people are now trying to kill me. She doesn't sound cozy, but the way that the author writes it, just the atmosphere and the way in which the different people are, there's like these two old ladies that are really eccentric and interesting and cute and wholesome. And there's this man who kind of watches over this area and he is a protector of the woods. And it's just, this just has that classic fantasy feel that I, I know so many of us really enjoy. After that, one of my favorites as a kid, Alana, the lioness, Song of the Lioness. Ugh. I loved this. I need to reread this. I say it every time I bring it up. I miss this story. It was one of my favorites as a kid. In the first book, you follow Alana as she goes to a magic school. However, uh, it's actually the opposite. Let me clarify. Her brother should be going to the school to become a warrior, and she should be going to a different school because the boys go to one, the girls go to the other. So they decide to switch places, disguise themselves as each other, and go to these places because their passions lie in the other place. And so she goes to the school to become a warrior. She's pretending to be a boy. And then she is just, you're just following her as she grows up. And it's so good. It was one of my, like I said, it was one of my favorites as a kid. It's one of the things I fell in love about fantasy. And this is part of a shared world. So you actually have other books 
where this character later, you hear about her and she shows up in another series that takes place chronologically after. And I just think that that's so cool. And what a cool thing for kids too, because we talk about that kind of stuff with the Cosmere and things like that. But it was so awesome as a kid to be like, oh my gosh, I remember. And it was just exciting. It was just exciting. And then we have the Goblin Emperor. This is pretty dense. I'm not going to lie, but it has this feeling of classic fantasy and you're following this young man. I talk about this all the time, so I'm sure you know. You follow this young man, half goblin, and he is not treated well. However, everybody in line for the throne before him is killed and suddenly he is on the throne and he has so many political adversaries. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's going to try his best, darn it. And so you're following him as he does that. And he is so sweet. I feel like that's really what solidifies this being cozy is he is so sweet and wholesome and adorable. He's trying his best and he's genuinely so pure hearted. Oh, he's such a cinnamon roll. I love him so much. And then last, not older, but has again that classic fantasy feel mainly because it has sort of a coming of age story in it. And that would be the magician's daughter. This is a story that follows a young girl who was raised by this man on this island. He's not her biological father, but it's a mystery what happened to her real parents. And he raises her as his own. They have such a sweet bond. He has a familiar. It's so cute. <laughs> and then one day his past comes calling. The wards on the island that have protected them are starting to fail. And so he has to confront his past and she sort of confronts his past alongside him without really knowing what it is. And so you're seeing her be exposed not only to the horrors of reality and the world, but also coming to terms with the fact that maybe her parental figure was not this perfect beacon of pureness that she thought he was. And so she's learning about him as well. And you're kind of wondering, like, was he a villain in the past? And you're getting to see all of that alongside the character. And like I say, it just has a certain feeling that is reminiscent of classic older fantasy. But that's it for a guide to cozy fantasy. I know there are so many other books that I probably could have mentioned or that I haven't read yet, so I couldn't have mentioned, but that would fall into a lot of these. So if you'd like to leave any of your own recommendations, feel free to do so. Like I said at the beginning, all of these will be in the description bar down below. Thanks so much for watching though. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.